Welcome to Wagontown Chapel. Good to have you all here. Finally, it looks like maybe some spring coming our way. So guys, get the lawnmowers ready. Would you please bow your hearts and minds with me as we open in prayer this morning? Heavenly Father, we thank you. We come before you humbly, thanking you for all that you've done for us in the past, what you're doing for us today, and what you're going to do for us tomorrow. There's so many things going on in this world right now, Lord, and we certainly are at a loss for what to do. But we know that you are in control of our lives and everything. So we're asking you, Lord, to be with us today. We're inviting you to be in this house with us. Speak to us. Teach us. Show us what we need to do, how we can be the people you've created us to be. Thank you, Lord, for loving me, loving everyone here in this building, loving those who are watching. You're an awesome God. We praise your name, the name Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. It is good to see each of you here today. And uh, it's a blessing, as I say, every week to have you guys here today. And I uh, hope that it's uh, a time that we can uh, be, uh, be uh, just glorify the Lord and to, and to be uh, excited to be in the house and to get into the Word as well, too. You can follow along for... Um, Actually, I'm jumping way ahead of the game here. I'm looking at the bulletin now, and I'm way off. So we're going to go right to the hymn. We're going to go right to the hymn. So you're going to stand and turn your hymn books to page 704. 704 today as we sing together, God will make a way. And then following then, the praise team will come right up, and we'll get, jump right into those songs too. i 
ahead of time, but um, you can follow along in your bulletin for the things that are happening. We do invite you back Wednesday night, Wednesday night, as we continue our study in uh, the study of prayer and uh, seeing how the Lord works through that and the timing of that. And so we encourage you to be out for that too. We will also be praying on Wednesday night. It's always a prayer time taking a prayer request and praying together, but also learning how to pray is um, vitally important and um, something not to be overlooked. 
in any way of the whole matter of prayer. So join us on Wednesday night for that study as well too. And um, so that is the first thing. The second thing here is uh, this Saturday is the sportsman's event. And so we ask you to be praying for that and be praying for God to move and to act uh, through that day. Um, again, we know that we do it to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with those that will be here. And so ask that you be praying for that day in particular as well. If you still like to bring water, you can certainly do that. Uh, I know some of you have brought cases of water and that has been uh, awesome. And we thank you so much, uh, very much for that. And if anybody else would like to do that, you can bring it this week all the way up till Saturday at one o'clock. So, um, so, but be praying for that. And we ask that you be uh, thinking of that and praying for that throughout the week and in particular um, Saturday as well too. Looking forward to see how the Lord will move and uh, through, through that time as well too. Um, also, you do have your, uh, today is the last day for your flowers. If you have flowers that you want to get for Easter, um, today's the last day to turn this in so we can order them probably tomorrow um, and so that they are in, so that they're here in time uh, for that. And so if you have anybody that you would like to give an honor of or memory of and, and all of that, so we encourage you to do that today as today is the deadline for the flowers as well too. So but, and we, we, uh, we do want to mention again Easter and, uh, and that. Next week is Palm Sunday, so we'll be off of Genesis for the next few weeks because of East or Palm Sunday and Genesis. Looking forward to sharing what the Lord's already laying on my heart uh, for, for next week and for Easter as well. And uh, so we encourage you to invite uh, family, friends out for that and, or encourage them to, to uh, tune in and watch it uh, online. Um, but come. It's much better to come, you know, um, the fellowship. You don't get the fellowship at home. I know you can get your laundry done, but when you're focusing on how you fold your laundry, you're not focusing on the Word of God. So, uh, so I encourage you to be in the house of God uh, as well. So, but invite people out for that. And so the next two Sundays are that. But Easter Sunday, obviously 11 o'clock is the main Easter service for the day, but also 6.30 that morning will be the sunrise service outside here, Lord willing. I've yet to, since I've been here, and it has nothing to do with me, obviously, um, but it has yet to, we have yet to have one inside um, on, a, on a Palm Sunday, uh, excuse me, on an Easter Sunday for a sunrise service. And so I'm hoping I'm not jinxing it, but... Um, but I'm praying that the Lord will allow us to be outside again. So 6.30, it won't be, uh, you know, it'll be like a 15, 20-minute service outside. And uh, you go home and come back uh, for the service at 11. And we'll dive into uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ once again at 11 o'clock on Easter Sunday. So we encourage you uh, to, to make that on the forefronts of your minds and to think about that too. In addition to that, um, uh, Coming up, not this Thursday, but the following Thursday, the Thursday before um, Easter. So this Wednesday is Bible study on prayer. The following Wednesday will not be, it will be Thursday night, April 1st, for the Passion Service. That is a communion service as well. So we'll have the communion um, little kits out there when you walk in on that Thursday night. And so we encourage you to plan for that too, as we remember and go through uh, what the Lord had shared with his disciples that last night with them um, before he would be, uh, well, in that night he'd be arrested and then tried, and we know Friday would be crucified. And so uh, we encourage you to, to, to be a part of that service as well on April 1st, that's a Thursday night. I'll make sure we remind you next, when, next Sunday uh, of, that, of that time change that we do each year as well. Make sure you make note of the nursery workers for today and for next week and see if you have to make any changes within that 
as well. And um, so let's go right into uh, our congregation and concerns. You can follow along in that as well too and see the continued names that we've had on here for quite some time. And, and a lot of them we'll have on here for, uh, for a lifetime uh, until the Lord calls them home. But uh, we want to continue to be praying for each and every one. I want to do add one on to this is uh, Frank Leslie. Frank Leslie was um, actually had to go by ambulance to the hospital this past week. Um, he, was, he was getting a pacemaker change, but his breathing was really not good. And so they took him there. They did chase, change the pacemaker, and that's been done. The surgery went well with that, but um, he hasn't come home yet. He's still in Chester County Hospital today. Um, they're still dealing with fluid around his heart. And so pray that they can uh, deal with that. He has um, lost a lot of the fluid already, um, even within yesterday. And so God is already at work there. But just pray that that, that, that would continue to be. And uh, probably won't go home today, maybe not even tomorrow. But um, we pray that the Lord would, would uh, help within that um, removing of the fluid around the heart. and Because uh, everything else is fine. The pacemaker's in and all that. It's just, just trying to get them to recover from that and then be able to come home. So, so we ask that you'd add Frank Leslie to the prayer list as well today as we uh, bow before the Lord Almighty, the Holy One. So let's pause and let's pray. When I'm done praying, when we're done praying, then Junior Church can be dismissed. And uh, then we'll dive right into uh, the message of God's Word today. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you um, to be in your presence God, what a privilege it is to come before the Holy One and, and, and to know that we're coming before the Holy One having done nothing to even come. God, we wouldn't even be able to find you without the working of you in our life. We wouldn't even be able to come into your presence without the Son, Jesus Christ, dying for Sin, giving access to you, not freely, but by the blood of the Lamb. And that as we come before your presence today, and just the, just the matter of fact that we are entering the holy place, even before we begin to unload on you the request of our hearts, that we would fully perceive and understand whose presence we enter. And Father, I pray that within that, right hearts and minds would come before you, for we know that your word tells us that you tell us that you cannot hear us when we have sin that is not dealt with in our lives. So in understanding whose presence we come into, we also understand that there must be forgiveness, repentance of sin. So Father, we pray for that now and we deal with that now and we come before you and seek forgiveness that we may come to you with clean hearts, right hearts. And Father, we do bring before you which you know every name, every circumstance in its greatest of details even beyond what we know of any of them. But you know the prayer request, even before it enters our mind, even before it leaves our lips. We thank you, God, for knowing these things and for being who you are to not only know the things, because knowledge is of one thing, but the power and the authority to do something about it is something, Lord, that we take for granted in you. And so, Lord, we pray for the hurting and the sick today. We pray for those that are in nursing homes not able to be visited. We pray for those in hospitals who aren't able to be visited too much. Those that are recovering from surgeries, Father, we lift up Frank today to you. We pray that you would touch the fluid around his lung, that it would disperse, that you would allow it to disappear. 
We pray that you would help him to be able to come home here as soon as possible. We pray for others, Lord, who are in the same situation. Lord, as far as being in a hospital bed or recovering from something, we ask that you would work physically in their life. Father, we pray that you would not only do that, but that you would also work not only in the physical, but in the spiritual, Lord, as each of our hearts and minds today are in desperate need of you. Lord, it's not only a, a working of the healing process of our physical bodies, the aches and the pains, and so often we focus on those things much more than the more critical things of the heart. But we also pray, Father, that you would work in our, our hearts, that we would grow in the knowledge of your word, the understanding of you, holy, almighty God, and that we would fall more in love with you. We pray today for our missionaries, those that are preaching the word of God faithfully in various areas and those that have been so discouraged over the years, Lord, in difficult places. We lift them before you today. We ask that you would encourage, build up, and strengthen each one. We pray today also for our nation. Lord, we pray that you would forgive us when we understand that that starts with each of us individually. We pray for those in authority. Lord, we ask that you would work in the lives of those who serve in political realm those places of tremendous authority, those to whom can write the law, those that who can pass the law. We pray that they would not forget your law. We pray, Father, for a tremendous working in our nation. We pray for our president, vice president, those that surround each of them. We pray, Father, for your hand to return. And we know that that can only come by hearts that are broken over one sin. Lord, may we return to you. Understanding, Father, that we can't on our own. That we desperately need you to motivate us, to push us. Lord, I ask these things in my own life today and each life that is here and listening in as well. We pray for all of these things so much more today. We pray for the sportsmen's event as well, that you would work and the people that will be here on Saturday, that their hearts would be open to the conviction of the Holy Spirit, to the conviction of their own sin, to the need of a Savior. We ask, Lord, and we look forward to how you're going to move and act even if one comes to know you. Oh, is it worth it? For we know that heaven rejoices even when one comes to know you. Father, we ask all of these things in your precious Son, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. In his name we ask it. Amen. For those in the junior church can be dismissed. I wanted to obviously continue our study through the book of Genesis. We will take, as I mentioned already, a two-week break at least next week and Easter week through that. But then we'll follow right back into Genesis to continue our study of it as well. Let me change my screen here. You can turn into Genesis chapter 41 this morning as we continue the study of the book. And as you do that, I want to just kind of preface uh, continually what the Lord has continued to lay in my heart through the study 
of Genesis, and not only within the study of Genesis, but throughout each time that the Lord gives me the opportunity to, to stand behind a pulpit and to preach the Word of God, and I, I pray that I do it faithfully. And each week my, my prayer is that, is that we will see the God of the Bible as we often, often talk about, and that we will get to know and understand Him more and more. And there's nothing more important to the church than any church for that matter, but than to know the word of God and to the one to whose words it is. Our spiritual lives depend on it, and this is what gives us the substance spiritually. It's what grows us, it's what matures us, it's what encourages us, challenges us. And causes us to trust, to love, and to rest in God. But it also pushes us. It drives us and it molds us and it breaks us. And it restores us as well. And this is what the Word of God does. And we like the first part. We like the growing, the maturing, the encouraging. But we don't like the second part. The pushing and the trying and the molding and the breaking. But that's what the word of God does. It reproves, it corrects, it rebukes, it builds. And as we have seen in our study of Genesis, I hope that you have seen God in the midst of our study. And though we're not done the book yet, I want to... Just take an opportunity now just to remind us of, again, who the God of the Bible is. And that we would have seen him in the midst of our study in this book of Genesis each and every week. And I pray that as God has done in my own life, that it is also, that he has also done in your life, that it has changed you. That now we have just known the stories of, of Genesis the popular ones from the creation of the world to, to Noah and the ark. But that it has gone beyond the stories that it has been about the very God up to who it is written of. The God of the Bible. And we have seen thus far in our study of Joseph that we have seen God through it all. And our text today is no different. In fact, in my study last week and this week of this text, and thinking about where the Lord wanted to take us today, and I say us because I'm included in it, and typically I would preach a section of Scripture Word or uh, verse by verse, and I'm doing that today also. I am highly uh, centralized on the expository preaching of the word. But uh, today we're going to do the same. Today I'm going to cover one verse only. We're going to read a few more through our text just to kind of pull it together. But my focus will be just verse 1 today of Genesis 41. And before we dive into that, I you see I already placed it on there. I didn't want you to see my title quite yet. But I want to ask you a question. When does waiting turn to frustration? I mean, we have no control over many things of our lives. None of us likes to wait. But we know that it is a normality of life is waiting. But to really think about when, when, when waiting turns into frustration. And we probably really haven't taken time to really think that what brings frustration in the time of waiting. And I believe it fully is this is that waiting turns into frustration when 
we have lost control of the situation to which we're in and thinking it's all about us. If you're in line at a fast food chain and you're waiting for and you place your order and you already have an expected built up time in your mind of how long it should take from the time of order to when they reach out the window and give you your order. And sometimes that is frustrating in itself in waiting, especially if you're hungry. And so hunger has to do with you at that time. But let's say that the French fries, they just put a fresh batch in. And so they, they tell you to pull off to the side sometimes. And they say, hey, you need to pull off to the side because the fries are still cooking and we'll, we'll bring them out to you. Well, now waiting has come to frustration because now what you have expected to drive through and be handed, now you're pulled off to the side and now this is not what you expected. And now you're frustrated. And so the expectation sometimes that we have in life in waiting when it, the expectation becomes unexpected, that revolves around us, then waiting becomes frustrating and most difficult, even though waiting in and of itself is difficult. I want to share today in verse 1 of our chapter of Genesis 41, as I said, this will be the main text, and I will read a few other verses to bring it together, but we're not going to dive into the full story of the text today. I, be, I feel that God has something much more different for you and I. It says in verse 1 of chapter 41 of Genesis, it says, And it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed and behold he stood by the river. Now two full years of what? Well, keeping it in context, we know the chapter before what happens. Well, it was the dreams of the baker and the butler. But previous to that, it was the Accusing of Joseph not properly doing what Potiphar's wife wanted him to do, which led to Potiphar throwing Joseph into jail. And so now we read in verse 1 that it has come to pass at the end of two, two full years. So we understand the text simply as this, is that Joseph has been in prison for two full years. You say, Tim, how are you going to preach a sermon on just this verse? Well, we're going to look at the waiting portion of Joseph and how the sovereignty of God goes with it. In fact, I believe that you become a better waiter, not a one that treats tables, but a waiter on God when you understand the sovereignty of God, or at least know it. So at the end of two years, we would have a hard time with this. Because let's, let's just refresh our memory very quickly. Is that why is Joseph here? What has he done? What has Joseph done? Nothing. He's done nothing. So to wait on something to which you have done is a little easier because you have done it. But to wait on something that you have had nothing to do with can be certainly frustrating. Extremely difficult. We think of our own circumstances. 
We've covered this topic many times as far as the waiting of God or, or, or the waiting on God. And if we would take time today to go around the sanctuary and ask each of you, you know, how long has things happened in your life that you're still waiting on God to do? Or maybe God has got you through it, but it was this period of time. And those times would, would be all over the place. For some of you, you're still waiting on God. It hasn't been two years. It's been 10, maybe 15, maybe 20 or more. And you know what it's been from a human standpoint? Frustrating. It's frustrating. When you're waiting on God to change your spouse, maybe to change your heart, maybe to change your circumstance, maybe to change your health, maybe to change your relationship. Joseph in jail, having done nothing, Deserving to get there. He's waiting. And as I said, it's not just two years of waiting, but two years of waiting in jail. It's one thing to wait for your fast food a few minutes longer. That, how frustrating is it is when you are handed the bag and you look at it and you say, they forgot the fries. But to wait two years, not for fries, but for sitting in a prison cell. And we know what Joseph's heart has been. We looked at it last week as he had poured into the heart of the butler and expressed what he said of the interpretation of his dream. And to the baker and how they both came to be. And the waiting that Joseph would have, and, and we read in verse 23 of, of the last chapter, because it's going to go well with today, and yet did not the chief brother remember Joseph and forgot him. Remember Joseph had gone to him and said, hey, you are at the ear of the Pharaoh every single day because you are his cupbearer, and I just ask of you that you would please tell the Pharaoh about me. And we read that the butler had for gotten him, did not mention anything to Pharaoh, but had forgotten him. Not only waiting in jail for two years, but also waiting knowing you are innocent. Oh, how you have, I would have been. How would our have waiting have been? Let me ask you a more personal question. How is your waiting Right now, as you're waiting on God to do whatever it is that you want him to do, how's your waiting been? I'm sure some days are better than others, but some days as all humanity is frail and professional sinners, there are many days as we wait on God, we are frustrated to the point of anger. Hurt, upset. And you know why? I'll put it bluntly. Because you think it's about you. And so do I. But when the mindset and the renewing of the mind comes from the word of God. You begin to see things in light of the way that God is and who he is. And this is why. It's not that I choose to preach the, the God of the Bible each week just because uh, I want to. It's because I'm, I'm told to. To preach the word in season and out of season. 
when we think about it, when we think about us, and the waiting period, it becomes excruciating for sure. Joseph had been waiting to two years, it says. Came to pass at the end of two years. And then we're going to see, not today, we won't dive into it, but as I said, I'll read a few verses. Pharaoh has a dream. Actually, two dreams. And we're going to see how the sovereignty of God comes through this. And when we are in a time of waiting, we ought to think in the moment that we are, oftentimes we think we're the only ones waiting, right? Nobody's waiting like I've waited. We're the only ones that are dealing with the waiting. When you're going through the waiting... Our reaction oftentimes is that we are the only ones doing it. But yet I have yet to meet a person in my lifetime, and I would safely say in your lifetime for yourself, have you ever met a person who hasn't waited? And I don't mean just for fries at a fast food place. I mean waiting on the Lord to do something. Because we all think about ourselves and when we think about ourselves, it's easy not to think of anyone else. Not even to say not to think about the people in your life, but even more importantly, when you're thinking and focusing on yourself, you're certainly not thinking about God. Let me remind you that the waiting on God has been a common thread throughout the Bible. All through the Bible. Now I want to take a, a, just a few minutes just to kind of revisit some of these areas of waiting and see how God had worked through those times. Because I want to remind you and I, even though we know this in the deepest parts of our hearts, that we aren't the only ones waiting. There are others that are waiting or have waited for the hand of God. David. His brothers show up on the scene. They're all more handsome than he is. But God's not looking on the outward appearance. He's looking at the heart. And Samuel would anoint David king. For those that know the story well, and you ought to, was David made king that day? You might not know the time frame, I would say probably 15 years later, he would become king. How hard would it be to be anointed king and have to wait 15 years to do what you were anointed to do? You think David would have been frustrated? Certainly. But let me ask you this, did David become king? Certainly. Just in God's timing, which has a lot to do with the sovereignty of God. How about Jonah? We'll jump down the the waiting time frame a lot shorter time period. But Jonah is swallowed by a big fish and he spends three days in the belly of a fish. I don't know what I would rather do, wait 15 years to be anointed, to be king or be spent three days in the belly of a fish. But we know that, at least for the moment, Jonah's heart would break because we read a tremendous prayer of Jonah while in the belly of the fish. And so what may have felt a long time for Jonah and 
nobody knows what it is to be in a belly of a fish. But for him, it might have been a long time, and yet, three days later, what happens? God causes the fish to spit him up on dry land. There is the sovereignty of God. How about Joshua? Joshua, I want you to gather your men. And before you do this, though, I want you to sanctify yourself. I want you to set apart yourself. And I'm going to ask you that you would walk around the walls of Jericho. Day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six. Not even a slight crack in the wall of Jericho. And Joshua and the Israelites waiting for God. And then comes day seven. They walk. They're not silent that day. They shout. They blow the trumpets all for the glory of God in the Jericho wall. Falls. Now those are instances besides Jonah that they were out of their, now they were all out of their control, but Jonah, his stupidity in going the opposite way God called him, although the sovereignty of God knew that and was in full control of that anyway, but but Jericho was the purpose and plan of God. So was David becoming king. The next illustration quickly would be Israel. And it was their fault of why God did this as well too. And we see the sovereignty of God in it. But Israel would spend 40 years wandering in the wilderness. Going in circles. Wondering, complaining. It was better for us to stay in Egypt. We were slaves, but at least we had food and good food. Where is this promised land that the God of the Bible tells us about? So Israel would wait 40 years. But guess what? What would happen? They see the promised land. So as we read here in verse 1, Joseph, before two years had passed, and what's Joseph doing? He's waiting on God. As I said, for many of you, the waiting may have been days, weeks, even years. It's hard. But this is not why, this is why I titled it Waiting and the Sovereignty of God. You see, there's a second part to all of these stories that I've read, or not read, but just shared briefly, and we continue in the study of Joseph's life here, and it is a most important part, because I believe the waiting period on God will be all the more easier when you know the sovereignty of God. I want you and I to understand and see this most important point. Not speaking particularly to the sovereignty of God in this text, but I encourage you to read Isaiah chapter 41. I preached it many times, the story of 
Israel and God talking about Israel and they just want a cup of cold water and God says, I will not only give you a cup, I will put springs of water in the desert, I will make pools of water in the wilderness, I will plant the shitta tree, the myrtle tree, and the box tree together. And it's expressing the power and the authority of God in the text and how God is able to do the impossible To cause trees to grow in places of dry land such as the desert or the wilderness. And then that section ends with this verse I'm going to put on the screen. And this is the full purpose of the entire chapter of Isaiah 41. In fact, it's the full purpose of the entire Bible. In particular, the sovereignty of God. And what is the sovereignty of God? It is, it is that God is all, has all authority to do whatever he wills. And he is in full control. Isaiah 41, verse 20. This is why that they may see and know and consider and understand all of those things together that the hand of the Lord has done this and the Holy One of Israel has created it. Why? Why do you wait? Why do you struggle? Why do we have burden after burden and waiting for God to do something in our life to change the circumstance? The very centrality of the point is this, is for the glory of God. Because he alone is God and not you and not me. It says here that that we would see, and that means to literally see or even figuratively see who God is. To know, which means to recognize who God is. To consider, which means to make out or to hold or to mark it. To underline it. To understand. Bringing all these things together. That we would see, to know, to consider, and understand who the God of the Bible is. And that in his sovereignty, God causes you and I to wait on things for his glory alone. We read in other portions of scripture that he also does it so that it would build up patience in us, that we would mature. That we would grow. And God is doing this ultimately. Why is Joseph in jail for these two full years? And I love the terminology in verse 1. It doesn't just say two years. It says two full years. Emphasizing the longevity of the time that he's in. Reminding us also the innocency of Joseph to why he's in. For what purpose? The sovereignty of God. God is in control. He can do whatever he wants, but he is in full control. He alone is God. And Joseph, I believe, through this time, is biding his time. He's encouraging, building up. That's 
That's why God used him. The sovereignty of God placed him in that jail. The sovereignty of God placed him in there for a particular reason so that Pharaoh would hear the ear of Joseph. But up to this point, Joseph doesn't know how it's going to happen. He just knows it's going to happen because he still remembers the dream that his family would be bowing down before him. That God was in full control. And if Joseph wasn't in jail, he would have never gotten to the ear of Pharaoh, which he's about to in this chapter, which we'll look at the week after Easter. As I said, the second part of this is the sovereignty of God and that God rules and has authority over his creation and he is free to do whatever he wills. He's being in full control of it all. But the hope is this, is that those that wait on him, whether it be years or whether it be for a lifetime, because we go back to the story I forgot to mention about Paul. Remember Paul in 2 Corinthians where Paul goes to God and he has this, whatever it is, this thing called a thorn in his side. And Paul goes to God and says, God, remove it. In fact, Paul goes to God three times and asks him to do it. And every single time, God doesn't. And so there are times where the waiting on God will be for a lifetime. But for Paul, and for you, and me, God's grace is sufficient. So whether it be for a few years, a few weeks, or a few days, or a lifetime, the hope and the trust is the sovereignty of God that he is in full control. And because God is who he says he is, we trust him, which causes us to be more patient in the time of waiting. Knowing that he has a plan and a purpose. I know that I'm going over, but I want to finish this up. So bear with me. Just a few minutes later. Turn with me quickly to Psalms 105. We had referenced this last week as well. Psalms 105, really quick. This is talking, well, this portion of scripture that I'm about to read is talking about Joseph, not the entire chapter is, but this portion is. We, we, we referenced it last week, but Psalms 105 in verse uh, 17 says this, and this is speaking about God. You go back up to verse 7. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are over all the earth. And it is he, he, he all the way down. Then we read in verse 17. He, God, sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, whose feet they did hurt with fetters. And he was laid in irons. Look at this verse. That, this is when Joseph is thrown in jail. Now look at verse 19. Here we read about the sovereignty of God until the time that his word, whose word? Joseph's word? No, God's word. Until the time of God's word came. The word of the Lord tested him. We'll look at verses 20 and 21 next week or two weeks or a week after Easter. But the sovereignty of God came to him. It was God's timing. Even though the innocency of Joseph for what he was in for, nobody's innocent, we're all sinners, but the innocency of Joseph being in jail for those two years, God had a purpose and a plan. It was preparing for what Joseph was going to be here in the next couple of chapters that we're going to read. Joseph had to wait on the word of God. And I'm going to tell you today that you and your waiting time and I and my end need to be waiting on the word of God. But as I started out this sermon on, it's hard to do. You know why? Because we think it's about us. But 
But it's not. It is God's holy word. This is not Tim's word. It's God's. It's not what I want. It's what he wants. Habakkuk 2.3 says this. For the vision, this is Habakkuk. Remember God had come to Habakkuk or Habakkuk with the God who said, God, how can you raise up the Chaldeans to destroy us? I don't understand. They're worse off than we are. So he's waiting on God to answer. And it says, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarries, though it waits, wait for it. Because it will surely come. It will not tarry. So God had a purpose for what he was doing with Israel in Habakkuk's day. And God says, wait on it. It will come. And I want you to know that the sovereignty of God brings hope. Whether it's a lifetime that you're waiting or whether it's a few days or whether it's a few hours or a few weeks or a few years, but it will come. The hope of the sovereignty of God of being in control will come. Whether for some of us it might come in eternity, but it will come. For Jonah, it was three days later. For, for David, it was 15 years later. For Joshua, it was seven days later. For Israel, it was 40 years later in that predicament. How about for Job? Didn't even mention him yet. Job would go through much, so much. The last chapter in the last few verses of Job, it says, Now the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 females and donkeys, or free female donkeys. And then it talked about our following this, that God would bless him with more kids. And that his daughters would be more fair than any other woman in the world. You think it was hard for Job to wait on God? We know it is because Job questions God. And then God questions Job. Where were you when I created this world? It might be for a lifetime. We don't have time today. I have to wrap up. I could easily go another hour, but I won't. But I want to give you some hope today, even in your waiting of time. You may say, Tim, where is the sovereignty of God with Paul? He waited an entire lifetime before that thorn in the side was gone. For 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 to 58, talks about the coming of Jesus Christ. The rapture of the church and the twinkling of an eye. And what happens there in the chapter we read about is that the body that is corrupt now becomes incorrupt. We have glorified bodies. So let me ask you this. Is Paul dealing with a thorn in the, in the side right now in eternity? No, he's not. You and I don't want to hear that either because eternity sounds like that. It sounds like that's a long ways away, Tim. You don't know what I'm waiting on God to do right now. It's been years. And I'll go back to it again. And I'm saying this to myself this morning is that the reality is when we struggle with that, yes, it's the humanity and the sinful nature of ourselves, but it comes back to our focus being on us and not him. First John 3, 2 says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet, yet been revealed what shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. 
and we shall see him as he is. Let me just point out one verse in Psalms 41, or excuse me, Genesis 41, and I'm done. Remember verse 23 of chapter 40. We're going to see where it is in verse in Joseph's life. Now, quickly, Pharaoh has the dream. Nobody can interpret the dream. We'll get into this in a couple weeks. But verse 9, really quick. Then spoke the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day, that Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me in the prison and the captain of the guard's house, both with me and the chief baker, and we dreamed dreams one and night, and I and he did too, and we dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream, and there was... With us, a young man, a Hebrew, servant of the captain of the guard, we had told him, and he interpreted to us our dreams. And each man, according to his dreams, did he interpret. And it came to pass that as he interpreted to us, so it was. With me, I was restored unto my office, and with him, he was hanged. So what does God's sovereignty do here? When we read it in verse 23 of chapter 40, that the butler remembered Joseph but forgot him because it was not the timing of God. Now it's the timing because Pharaoh has given God a specific dream that only Joseph will be able to interpret. And now the cupbearer remembers. I think the cupbearer was just sitting there one time and thinking, man, I gotta really think about it. It was God. God brought it to mind. The sovereignty of God. The butler remembered because God was and is in control. So today, as you and I are waiting on God for whatever it is we're waiting for, for him to do, do you, do you trust in the sovereignty of God? That he's in control. That yes, you might not like it. Joseph didn't like it either. And yet, God had used that time to build Joseph, to prepare Joseph to what Joseph is about to do. And that is to be second in command to all that Joseph, or excuse me, the Pharaoh has as well. God may not put you and I in second in command here on this earth, but if you are born again by faith alone in Jesus Christ and the finished work, knowing that your sins separate you from a holy God, and the only way is to seek forgiveness of that sin to repent before the holy God, knowing that you are without excuse and that you have no hope apart from Jesus Christ because God alone saves you and I have nothing to do with it. Let us not forget that the sovereignty of God in my life and your life as believers, our Father owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Revelation 21, 4 tells us that speaking of heaven, that God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more pain, no more sorrow, for the former things have passed away. That's the sovereignty of God. David would write in Psalms 27, Wait, I say on the Lord, be of good courage, and he will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say on the Lord. Heavenly Father, we just looked at one verse today, mainly. 
as far as the story of Joseph and Pharaoh. God, I pray that as you have shown me, that you, the Spirit, would have shown those here today and those listening in. That we all struggle with the waiting on you. And much of that struggle of waiting is because we only think of ourselves. But help us to know that the sovereignty of God, the one to whom can do all, does all, and is in control of all. Lord, that you are also in control of our life, that nothing gets by you. So even though we're waiting, we're not by ourselves we're not alone. Joseph wasn't alone in the jail. You had a purpose and a plan for his life as you do ours. In the Great Commission, you said, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. God, help us as we struggle with waiting. But help us to know all more importantly the sovereignty of the Holy One. I pray these things in my own life today. May we be willing to wait, knowing that you have in store amazing things, whether in this lifetime or in eternity with you. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll stand and sing a closing. Just the first verse of hymn number 597. Take my life and let it be concentrated. 597. <clears throat> Canon, regular of the, or he was a uh, person of the late medieval period, the author of a book called The Imitation of Christ, said these words, he deserves not the name of patient, who is only willing to suffer as much as he thinks proper, and for whom he pleases. The truly patient or the waiting man asks nothing from whom he suffers, whether his superior, his equal, or inferior, but from whomever or how much or how, how often wrong is done to him. He accepts it as from the hand of God and counts it gain. Do you wait on the Lord, counting it as gain? Heavenly Father, thank you for the time in your word. Thank you for the time in your house. Help us to leave here today ever so struggling with the patience of waiting on you. And Lord, maybe even not liking the outcome oftentimes, but help us to know that the sovereignty is not only given in this world, but also in the next, in eternity. And may we have the hope of heaven, the hope of eternity with you, which only comes by a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Thank you for it all. Give us a great rest of the day. Bring us back safely on Wednesday night. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.